you have your Bibles, grab them and turn to Nahum chapter 2, as we'll be in verses 11 and 13 today. We have spent the last five weeks studying Nahum's prophecy about the fall and destruction of the city of Nineveh. And in verse 10, we saw how Nineveh's inhabitants responded to the destruction of their city. They had melting hearts and trembling knees. They were sick to their stomachs and they grew uh, pale in the face. But now, at the end of chapter 2, we encounter a God-centered response to the fall of Nineveh in verses 11 and 13. In verse 10, we see a man-centered response. We have lost everything. But now we see a God-centered response that Yahweh has destroyed the evilness of this world. So it ends with Yahweh proclaiming his coming wrath and judgment upon the Assyrians, which will result in their destruction just as Nahum had just foretold in the rest of chapter 2. And so we see God coming and destroying the evilness of this world and bringing about his peace and justice. So with that, let us now turn to Nahum chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. The scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road. Dress for battle, collect all your strength. For Yahweh is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For the plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through all the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are opened and the palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped and she is carried off. Her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt! Halt! they cry but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den, the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion and the lioness went, where the cubs were with none to disturb. The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lioness. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts. Thou will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, whom have we in heaven but you? To whom shall we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Therefore, we now come to your words of eternal life, seeking these uh, words. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, a heart to believe, and your spirit to obey. Guide us with your counsel, O Lord. Amen. So the announcement of Assyria's demise begins with a rhetorical question. Where is the lion's den? Two things of note here. First, who is this lion? In the ancient Near East, the lion was a symbol for kingship. It was a symbol for royalty. Um, if you turn to Genesis uh, 49, verses 8 through 10, Judah is associated with royalty by his father Jacob, while Jacob is praying over all of his sons. In verse 8, he says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Now, if you know Judah, he's the fourth son born. Normally, what we see is that the eldest son has the right to rule. And yet, Judah is uh, proclaimed to be the one who would lead his brothers. And in verse 10, Jacob states, The scepter, which represents royalty, shall not pass or shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. So we see here in 
Genesis 49, that Judah is to be royalty among his family, that he shall be a ruler. But between those two verses, in verse 9, Judah is referred to as a lion. It says, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who, do, who dares rouse him. And so we see here in uh, Judah, in reference to Judah, he's referenced as a lion, but in that context, he's being referenced as a, uh, as a man who royalty would come through. And we see that with Jesus in the book of Revelation, as he is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we look at Revelation 5.5, 5, which says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And later on, Jesus is called what? The king of kings and the lord of lords. So he's called, so we see here, that even within, uh, within the Hebrew language, a lion often refers to as royalty. And the same is true in Assyria. So in Nahum 2, the lion, though, is referring to the king specifically and to the royal household and to the members of the aristocracy. We see this in the mentioning of not only the lion, but also his young lions, his lionesses, and his cubs. So where is the lion's den is referring to where is the king and where is his palace and where does he rule from? Likewise, we should note that the rhetorical question, where is the lion's den located? Nahum chooses to portray Nineveh as a lion's den, along with the Assyrian Empire as a pride of lions. He does this because the Assyrian kings were known for going on hunts and killing lions and also for depicting themselves as lions. In the Assyrian records, one king identifies himself as a potent lion. Another compared himself to a wild lion who is lordly with fruitfulness on the battlefield. And lastly, a third king claimed to rage like a lion against his enemies. There's a reason why... The lion is called the the king of the jungle. He is powerful. He brings chaos, but he also brings order. And so this is what the kings wanted to portray themselves as, the most powerful and ferocious animal who brings stability to his empire, but who would destroy those outside of his pride. That is to say the... Assyrian kings exhibited the ferocity of lions when attacking and devouring other lands, such as Israel and Judah. Now there's another person referred to as a lion within the New Testament. In 1 Peter 5.8, it gives us a New Testament parallel to this imagery of Assyria. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It's a direct parallel of what Assyria did. Assyria prowled around seeking other people to devour. In the same way, the devil prowls around the earth seeking those to devour. But like Nineveh, we know the devil and those who follow him will be destroyed before the wrath of God. Again, we can turn to the end of the Bible in Revelation 20. Verses 9 and 10, we see this. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Assyria is a type to that of the devil to that of the world, seeking to destroy God's people. But what happens? God comes and he defends his people and he will judge them and destroy them. And he will establish peace in all the earth. 
So with that in mind, we turn to the actual rhetorical question posed in Nahum 2.11, which states, where is the lion's den, the feeding place of young lions, where the lion and lioness went, where the cubs were, with none to disturb? Nineveh has become like a lion's den, where they devour and terrorize those in and near their territory. They kill their people and they bring them into exile. They bring them to be slaves. They bring them to be killed in their lion's den and devoured. Now the rest of verse 11 emphasizes the size and territory of this lion's pride, the size and territory of the Assyrian Empire. We see the pride's numerical size in verses 11 and 12. We see the word lion appear three times, along with the words of lioness, a variety of juveniles, as well as younger cubs. Nahum is portraying Nineveh and Assyria at its height of its power. Remember, Nahum is writing this decades before the fall of Nineveh. And so at their height of their power, he is writing this and saying, look at their size, look at their power. And he's saying, the judgment of Yahweh is coming and they will fall. They are a large and powerful empire, like a large and powerful pride of lions. Their den is Nineveh and probably Assyria proper. Their feeding grounds are the territories like that of Israel and Judah who were brought under their power. And lastly, we're reminded that up until this point, Assyria dominated the landscape of the ancient Near East with no one to challenge them as they had none to disturb them. They're this powerful pack of lions. Who can stop them? So Assyria is big and powerful, devouring the ancient Near East. But then Nahum asks this rhetorical question. Where are they now? At the height of their power, he says, there is one day coming where you will ask, where are they? Notice that it isn't a question really about location. Everyone knew where Nineveh was located. Everyone knew the boundaries of the Assyrian Empire. Rather, Nahum asked the question, where did they go? They no longer exist. What happened to them? At the height of their power, Nahum proclaims that this pride of lions will vanish. They will go extinct. and They will never be heard from again. The question is, why? Well, we see in verse 13, because Yahweh is against them. And then we see in verse 12. Verse 12 continues this rhetorical question by reminding everyone of Nineveh's violent existence and how it no longer exists, saying, The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lioness. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. So verse 12 gives us a vivid depiction of how Assyria attacked, how Assyria killed and devoured their neighboring lands like prey. But notice here that there is only one actor in verse 12. It says, the lion tore enough for his cups. The lion strangled his prey. The lion for his lioness. Now, the lion represents and portrays the king. So verse 12 contains three verbs and four subjects and adds an emphasis on the abundance of food provided by the lion. Out of the king's hunger for wealth and power and territory, he throws to the side all those who are image bearers of God. He doesn't see them as fellow image bearers. He doesn't see them as humans. He sees them as resources to take advantage of, to make himself more powerful, to bring people under his power and rule. It's the struggle. He even attempts to bring the people of God in Israel and Judah under his power and under his influence. The same battle goes on spiritually today. The world tries to conquer the church. The devil 
prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. We read elsewhere in the Bible and the New Testament that he would even deceive the elect if he was able to. And this is what the lion does in Assyria, seeking to conquer all that he can, spreading his false gods, power and influence. So as we said, verse, three, or verse 12 contains three verbs and four subjects. The lion has torn enough prey for his cubs. The lion strangles prey for his lioness. The lion fills his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. So it's the king who bears the responsibility for the devastation that he has brought But notice that all who follow him are punished. It's not that just Yahweh comes along and kills the king. He comes and destroys the king and the city and all those who would follow after this false king. The same will be true of us. You can follow Christ and have life. Or you can follow the devil and have death. Do you want to follow the true king or do you want to follow a false king? So this brings up two points. First, this plays into the ideological self-presentation of the Assyrian monarch. The Assyrian king wanted to be remembered, and so they were often leading, or leading every single attack in person from the front. We don't do this in modern warfare. The generals are not in the front leading the charge. But in ancient warfare, the kings were seen as the champion. The kings would go out and lead their people into battle. They would fight and lead. We often would think of this when we look at 1 Samuel 17. Who is supposed to be out there fighting Goliath? King Saul. But what is he doing? He's hiding in his tent. And so the next king, King David, the true champion of Israel, goes out and fights for his people. Or we can think of 2 Samuel 11, 1, where it says, in the spring, when kings go out to battle. Kings would go out to battle. Kings would lead their people into battle and they would fight on their behalf. So in ancient times, kings went out to battle. They fought alongside their troops. They fought in the midst of the battle. They were sweating, they were bleeding, and they were killing alongside all their men. So when they won and when they plundered their enemies, it was the king's doing and it was the king who was providing for his people. That's what Nahum is depicting here. It's a judgment upon the king, but it's a judgment upon all his pride. Secondly, there's this great example here of what we call federal headship theology. While the king takes responsibility for their success and failure, all the people share in the blame and as a result suffer the consequences of their sin. We see this in verse 10. Their hearts melt, their knees tremble, their stomachs hurt, their faces grow pale. God didn't just strike down the king, but he destroyed all of Nineveh and those who dwelled in it. Kings were often seen as the federal head or the covenantal head of their people, meaning that they represented the people before their God and represented God before their people. They were as we saw in the second London Confession, chapter 8, they were the mediator between the people and God. With that in mind, the most obvious example of headship theology is Adam and Christ. Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man. Christ perfectly represents redeemed humanity before the Father as our federal head. We are redeemed because he is perfect. Because the Father looks at the Son and says, He is perfect. He has lived perfectly in obedience before me. He has loved God and neighbor perfectly. He dies upon the cross to pay for our sins, and we are united to Him in His death. He is buried, raises three days later, and we're united to Him in His resurrection. So that when the Father looks at the Son, He sees that our sin has been reconciled. It has been dealt with. It has been punished. So that when he looks at us, he doesn't see us in our sinfulness. 
he sees Christ in his perfection. So we can, as Charles Spurgeon say, says, we can stand before the Father as Christ because Christ stands before the Father as us. And so we are counted as righteous, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Because he is our federal head. Because he is perfect. Because he perfectly represents us to the Father and perfectly represents the Father to us. So he is a perfect representation. Why? Because he is truly God as the second person of the Trinity. And he represents God to us. And he can perfectly represent us to the Father because he united to himself humanity in taking on flesh and dwelling among us. And so as we see in John 1, 1 through 18, Jesus is truly God and yet he is truly man. And why has he come into the world? To make the Father known to us. He's come to make him known to us. But he has also come to redeem us that we can be known by the Father. And that we can dwell with him and the Spirit and the Father forever and ever. But then when we think of the first federal head of humanity, that was the first man, Adam. God gave to him a covenant of works. or also known as a covenant of life. That is, do this and live. Now it's put in the negative. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you will live. But what do we know? A serpent comes into the garden and tempts Eve. Eve tempts her husband and they eat and they enter and they break the covenant um, of life. And by breaking the covenant of life, Adam brings death, not only upon himself, but also on all of his posterity as their federal head. So that when we come to Psalm 51 and we see that we were conceived in sin, brought forth in iniquity, that even from our very conception, we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. We are sinners because at our heart, that is our nature. We sin because we love sin, and that's who we are by nature. That's why we need a new heart. That's why we need the Spirit to dwell within us. We need God to cause us to love Him and to follow in His paths of righteousness. So, in breaking the covenant, Adam shoulders the responsibility for sin entering into the world. But all of us suffer the consequences. All of us suffer. We need to think no further than when we get sick, when we get injured, or we get cancer, or we die, or a loved one dies. We see the effects of sin. And it's because of Adam, and yet all of us, as the descendants of Adam, suffer the consequences which is why we need a new federal head, which is why we need Christ to come into the world, which is why we need Christ to redeem us from our sins. That's why Paul comes along in 2 Corinthians 5 and says that we are a new creation if we have been united to Christ. Likewise, we see in the Old Testament kings as federal heads for the kingdom of Israel. When When the kings did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, When the kings walked in the paths of their father, David, what did Yahweh do? He blessed the people. He blessed them. He brought them prosperity. But when the kings did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh and did not walk in the ways of their father, David, what did Yahweh do? He punished the kings and the people. This is what's happening in Nahum. Israel has been exiled. Israel and Judah is being punished by the Assyrians because they have rebelled against God. And this is what led to Israel being conquered by the Assyrians and the people exiled. This is why Assyria afflicts Judah by, but Yahweh relents. Why? Due to the father's uh, faithfulness, due to the king's faithfulness, and because of the, the king's faithfulness, the people became faithful. We see this in Hezekiah. And we see it in Josiah, his reforms of Israel and instituting the religion that God prescribed to them, that they would come back and be faithful. And what does God do? He relents. But Judah eventually goes into Babylonian exile because of the unfaithfulness of the kings, which led to the unfaithfulness of the people. But here's the beauty. 
We don't have an unfaithful king. We have a forever faithful king who has perfectly obeyed the Father, who has perfectly loved his neighbor, that he laid his life down for us. We don't have an, a, a disobedient king. We have an obedient king. We have a king who has been forever faithful to the Father. So he will always lead us in paths of righteousness. He will always bring blessing upon his people. Or as we see in the promise of Abraham. You will have a land, you will have a people, and you will be a blessing to all the people. Christ is the fulfillment of that promise. Christ is the blessing. First, in dying for our sins. Secondly, in giving us eternal life as a good king. And in doing that, he what? Redeems for himself a people. And he will one day bring us into his eternal kingdom. So Jesus is the blessing himself. He is redeeming for himself the people. And those people will dwell with him forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. We don't have a king that will lead us astray. We have a king who leads us to love him and to obey him. But in like fashion to the kings of old, the Assyrian kings had led their people to act in ways that were detestable before the Lord. So we see in places like Isaiah 10, Yahweh promises to judge Assyria and its kings for its arrogant heart and its boastful eyes. But before he promises their judgment, he says what? He's going to use them as a rod to discipline Judah. But after that time is complete, he's going to judge them for the evilness of their hearts. So here in Nahum 2, we see it's not just the king is punished, but Nineveh and all of Assyria. The kings of old had great power and influence over those who followed them. Therefore, we must be careful and diligent about who we follow and who we allow to influence us. The truth is, is we need to say, who is king of our life? Is it Jesus who will lead you into paths of righteousness, into eternal life, into loving God and following after his law and dwelling in his presence forever? Or will you follow after the kings of this world who will lead you in paths of destruction, who will lead you to eternal death and away from the presence of God? That there are no kings at all, but they're false kings. There is only one king who brings about the eternal godly rule. And that is Jesus. Because we see in verse 13, depending upon who we follow, God will either be for us or God will be against us. If God is for us, then we will have life. But if God is against us, then we will have death. This is the importance of us always returning to Nahum 1 verse 7. Yahweh is good, right? We could read this passage and think, man, Yahweh is mean. But what we see here, the, the premise of it, Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He protects those who know him. But if you are not taking refuge in him, then you are against him. So in verse 13, we see Yahweh declare this. I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts, and I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. It's a promise of complete destruction. And the premise is because Yahweh is against them. What fearful and dreadful words to hear from the mouth of the Lord. Behold, I am against you. There are no more terrifying words than to hear that God is against you. Jesus says, do not fear the one who can kill your body and then do no more. Fear the one who can kill your body and then destroy your soul in hell. And so he says, I am against you. How different is that from what we read in Romans 8.31 and following in the promises to God's people? So we see this, what we talked about earlier, 
in uh, reading the confession. But God saves those whom he foreknew. He predestines them. He conforms them to the image of his son. He calls them. He justifies them. He glorifies them. And after telling us that about our redemption, he says this. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That is, who can stand up against God's will? If God is for us, then no one can be against us. No one can harm us. No one can separate us from the love of God. He continues. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God didn't spare the most precious thing to him, namely his son. So there is nothing else that he wanted to give for us. So who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. And even if someone brings a charge against us, we have an advocate, Jesus the righteous, saying, remember my blood. Who is it that condemns Christ Jesus is the one who died? More than that, who was raised? It is the right hand of the Father who indeed intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall listen to all this. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? The Assyrians brought the sword. Should we fear them? Can they separate us from the love of God? No, as it's written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation in case I miss anything in those categories. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the difference there. God is for us. Who can be against us? Nahum, behold, I'm against you and I'm bringing destruction against you. So you have two options. Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. And if that's the case, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you are outside of him, though, he says, behold, I'm against you. I'm against your wicked ways. I'm against your destructive ways. I'm against your ungodly ways. If God is against us, then we are promised death and destruction. But if God is for us, then nothing can separate us from him and his love for us. But notice, for God to be for us, we must be in Christ. Christ must be our federal head. Christ must be our king. Christ must be our Lord. And if he is not, then we will die. We have no hope. But this is not so for the Assyrians or anyone who does not have Christ as their representative before God. I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. Those are fearful and dreadful words. Now, the title here, Yahweh Sabaoth, is a fascinating one. Luther writes it in his uh, hymn, A Mighty Fortress, the Lord of hosts his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. This title, Yahweh Sabaoth, can be translated as Lord of Hosts or Lord of Armies. It depends upon its context. Yahweh Sabaoth speaks to the vastness of God as Lord over all of creation. That he is Lord over the host of heavens, over the host of the earth, over the hosts of the whole entire universe. So it speaks of his vastness and his bigness. Or it can speak of God as a title that portrays him as a God of war, leading his armies into battle. Or as we see in Nahum 1, He is a warrior on a war path against Assyria and will bring their destruction. So in the context of Nahum, it's the latter interpretation that is implied. As Yahweh has been on a war path since the beginning to bring about his wrath and his vengeance upon Nineveh. And now we see him 
make war against Assyria, saying, uh, I will burn your chariots with uh, smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. Here we see two symbols of the Assyrian power. The chariot, which they had used to bring about the subjugation of all of the Mesopotamia basin. The chariot is what made them the most powerful empire that dominated the ancient Near East for hundreds of years. And likewise, the lion, which represented the king and the royal household and the succession of kings. They are now surrounded by smoke and by sword. The chariots that once conquered and burned other cities would now be conquered and burned themselves. And the lions who once devoured others with their swords would now be devoured by the sword. And with their destruction, Yahweh promises to deliver those who have killed, who have been killed and oppressed, saying, I will cut off your taking of prey from the earth. No more will the earth have to fear Assyria. No more will the earth have to suffer at their hands, for Yahweh is against them, and Yahweh is destroying them. And finally, the voice of the messengers shall no longer be heard. The messengers of Assyria once brought about the message of oppression and the message of war, but no longer. With the end of the Assyrian messengers, the messengers of peace come to Judah As we saw promised in Nahum 1.15, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah, fulfill your vows. For never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. They have been cut off. Their messengers of oppression and their messengers of war are no more. They shall never be heard from again. And in light of that, the messengers of peace come and they proclaim, Yahweh has destroyed his enemies. There is now life and peace because of Yahweh, who rules and reigns from Jerusalem forever and ever. Therefore, the reign of Assyria has come to an end. But this is only a temporal hope. In Christ, the reign of the devil, the reign of sin, the reign of death, which is typified in Assyria, has come to an end. And this is our eternal hope. The kingdom of this world has fallen. And the kingdom of heaven is here. And Christ rules and reigns presently from his heavenly throne. Unlike the kings of Assyria who wanted to be portrayed as militant lions, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered his enemies. Those who would persecute his people and establish true peace. But not only is he the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you read on in Revelation 5, he is also the lamb who was slain. And by his blood, he ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and nation, and people. And he has made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And we with him shall reign forever and ever. So we ask, who are these ransomed people? Of Revelation 5.5. 5. Those who as Nahum 1.7 says. Know that Yahweh is good. Know him as a stronghold in the day of trouble. Who is known by him. Who take refuge in him. If we are known by Christ. And take refuge in him. Then we know God is for us. And if God is for us. Nothing will ever be able to separate us. From his love. In Christ Jesus. So you can follow these false kings who are no kings at all and will lead you into no kingdom at all but into eternal destruction. Or you can follow the true king who promises to bring us into his eternal kingdom where we will live and reign with him forever and ever. Where we will enjoy him and glorify him for all of eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Nahum chapter 2. We thank you for um, being able to see your wrath against all unrighteousness. We 
which also tells us that that wrath was reserved for us, that we deserved it as being like the Assyrians, rebelling against you, rebelling against your holy law, and living for ourselves. And yet in your graciousness, you have come and taken our hearts of stone, which love sin, and you have given us a heart of flesh, which, lo- which loves you. But you have put your spirit within us to cause us to love you, and to follow your law, and want to obey you. Oh God, we give great thanks for this. May we never be handed over to the lion who seeks around, uh, who prowls around seeking those to destroy. But may we follow after the lion of the tribe of Judah, who stands slain like a lamb and redeeming his people by his blood. We give you great thanks for this. One day we will ask, where is Nineveh? Where is this world? Where is those who have persecuted your people? And we'll ask that, pre- we'll ask that question in your presence as we live and reign for you with ever and ever, where there is no sin, there is no effects of sin, but there is life and peace forever and ever. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus today. Amen. Yeah. Love you guys.